Good afternoon. Welcome to Lo Schermo dell'Arte and to this talk that we have organized in the context of the focus song we dedicated to Oliver Lyric that is here. Please, Oliver, would you like to join me? And Valentina Tanni, please, Valentina. You're welcome. Uh, Valentina is an art historian, curator, and lecturer. And her research is centered on the relationship between art and technology, with a particular focus on uh, internet culture. Uh, she's a, an adjunct professor of uh, digital art at Polytechnico University in Milan and of culture digital at the NABA uh, Academy. Uh, in Rome and in Milan, both. She published a couple of books that we, we think are very interesting and that's the reason why we have invited you here. Uh, Random, Navigando Contro Mano alla Scoperta dell'Arte in Rete, published in 2011. And uh, more recently, and we, we have discussed about this book quite a lot in Italy, his Meme Estetica, Il Settembre, dell Il Settembre Eterno dell'Arte, published by Nero in 2020. And uh, since uh, 2020, she's a member of the Roma Quadriennale Foundation's Board of Directors. Oliver Laric um, is a multimedia artist. Uh, um, he works with sculpture and video. And he explores themes such as metamorphosis, hybridization, authenticity, and reproducibility. Is one of the first artists to have manipulated the YouTube contents. Um, among his recent, recent shows in this year, uh, still run until January at the Stedelijk um, Museum in Amsterdam, um, an exhibition at OEC 18 in Shanghai, uh, in 2019 at the Forum Arte Braga, St. Louis Art Museum, Missouri, in 2018 at the Braunschweig Kunstverein and at the Tanya Leighton Gallery in Berlin. Um, he, ha he has also participated to many group shows. Uh, among them, Mudam Luxembourg this year, Shaja Art Foundation in 2020, and Museum for Moderne Kunst in Frankfurt in 2019, and in IC, a Boston 2018. And he took part to quite a, a lot of biennial and triennial. For example, Triennial Beaufort uh, 2021, Se Seoul Media City Biennial also in 2021, Yerevan Biennial also in 2021, and then in, in uh, Guangzhou Triennial, Sao Paulo Triennial in 2018, Liverpool Biennial in 2016, and new, uh, the train of the new museum in New York in 2015. They will discuss about uh, Oliver works and I hope you will enjoy this talk. Thank you very much. And thank you, Silvia, for the introduction. And of course, uh, I wanna thank the festival for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to have this conversation with Oliver because I've been a, a fan of his work since forever. And, but it's the first time you actually met, uh, meet and, and, and have the chance to discuss a little bit uh, about his work. And, uh, and of course, thanks Oliver for being here and thank you all for, for coming to the, to the conversation. Thank you, Valentina. Um, it's funny, like I've known Valentina online for, for many years and so, it's this um, strange thing of knowing somebody and then actually seeing the first the, the, the face and person for the first time. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so um, today, uh, as announced, we are going to discuss a little bit about uh, Oliver's work uh, and research. And um, the, the first artwork by Oliver that I came across uh, is called 5050. 
Is it pronounced right? It's 50-50? Okay. And uh, it's a video uh, Oliver made in 2007. Uh, 2007. Uh, uh, I think you made more than one version, right? Maybe two or, yeah? Yeah, I made the first version in 2007. And um, as with other pieces, would it be possible to switch to the screen, please? So I think yesterday we saw this version, for those of you who weren't there, I'll just play the first few seconds. So it was the first time, well, this was the first edition of it where I brought together 50 interpretations of 50 cent um, videos and um, I had um, quite immediate feedback, so maybe I can show this. Um, there was, um, back then, Yahoo had like a kind of news channel, which didn't last very long, but they did a, they responded to it, which made me quite happy. Go shorty, it's your birthday. We're gonna party like it's 50 people singing 50 cents. Go, 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 go. Um, and I then redid the video a year later because the archive of YouTube material was growing and so there were more and more people making these fan videos and I'll just play the first 10 seconds of the 2008 version where nothing really changed but everything changed. Go, go, go. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this work is a, a montage of 50 clips you took from YouTube and you mounted the, the, the clip, you assembled the clip to make it sound like a continuous renditions of the songs, like a, 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 like three, like the whole song, you can, you can hear it by uh, mixing, mixing the pieces. And um, so it, the, the first time I saw it, um, I thought that uh, it seems like... Um, like a source of like, like a crowd so, uh, crowdsource music video, like an alternative music video to the original track, and maybe also a, a kind of collaborative online performance where people uh, had the chance to um, sing uh, and perform over the songs. And uh, um, the thing that that uh, I think it's interesting to uh, to notice is the fact that these work of yours came out in a in a very particular story historical moment because uh, uh, it was only two years after the birth of YouTube, so it was the beginning of the so-called social media era, so it was, it was probably the first time that we began to see the, I mean, the, the, how this participation was going to become wide in the future. I, I, I remember being um, really fascinated by this sudden rise of participation, and so uh, were, were you interested too in, in, in the reinterpretation of content by anonymous people all around the world? This idea of uh, uh, having the possibility to see all these covers and all these interpretations? Yeah, I, it was a complete novelty for me and having that at kind of the fingertip of like a search, um, like a quick YouTube search or whatever other program it was or, or platform it was, and um, yesterday we showed the first 50-50 and we briefly talked about it and I mentioned how I don't know how well it aged because this phenomenon was a novelty then but it's become really commonplace now so the kind of super cut um, compilation type video is really standard now and um, but I remember showing this to people and like showing it the first time in, in exhibition spaces and it was just like well how did you get this material and it was maybe a different way of gathering material um, then in the times of um, super, what is the uh, Dara Birnbaum piece, the um, superwoman? Um, uh, ah, um, Dara Birnbaum. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, the the, wor the video work by Dara Birnbaum uh, with Wonder Woman. I don't Wonder remember Woman, exactly. the, the, the exact title. Like yeah. Dara Birnbaum made these cut-up videos, were using Wonder Woman footage, and in the 70s she had to 
find out where the editors of the TV show, which bar they went to, and uh, would go there, befriend them, and then get access to the material. And so I think there was a, a difference in, obviously, that era than you know, the era where uh, YouTube was fresh, and then maybe now it also feels, feels different again. Uh, but from the beginning, um, I put these works online, and that was where I showed them. So it wasn't so much the exhibition to be followed by the website of documentation, but the, the website was the first uh, place of experience. And immediately, um, other people be began interpreting them, and that kind of stuck with me as something that I yeah, felt um, passionate about, because it meant to me that there was something, there was, it felt alive, like it felt I wasn't just um, closing off a chapter and putting it into an exhibition space, but it just was kind of more the beginning, like showing it was the beginning of something. And where did you find any remakes of the same work? Did someone try to add pieces to this work, or you found covers of it? Because sometimes when you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, you publish things online, especially on social platforms, uh, people can do the same thing you did with the, with the original material. So appropriate the material and make other things uh, with the material. I don't know if it yeah. maybe not with this work, maybe with other works, but this, I don't know if, it, yeah. if it happens to you frequently to see your material reviews at the same time. It, it happens yeah. quite regularly. I mean, we're probably going to briefly talk about versions later, but yeah. there's a video which I made called Versions where we showed one version yesterday. And um, I at one point I got an email from somebody at uh, the Juilliard School, this music school in New York, performing arts school, and they asked if they could utilize the video because they wanted to make this kind of play version, and I can briefly show what they did with this. This is very low res. Well, then replacing him with scales. Images were taken from broken and buried in a hole before the cathedral where they would lie until Judgment Day. I bought a book on the cathedral a week later, did I really see it? The photograph enabled me to see in a way that my naked eye could not possibly... Yeah, maybe it's not so interesting to show, but maybe uh, I'm, I'm mentioning it because I was quite uh, open in sharing this. I didn't ask for any, um, anything in return. No, there was no fee or anything. And then when they made this, um, I kind of found it online. They didn't, they didn't share it with me. And I'm like, oh, this is great. Thanks for, for doing this wonderful event. Would you mind sending me a higher resolution copy? And I said, oh, well, like, we can't do this. It's not possible for really? whatever um, reason. So that's why I only have this tiny resolution <laughs> video. Um, but um, it started, I mean, I could show something else, which, so I showed before that there was this Yahoo thing which came in response to the 50-50. I did another video, which we're showing later, called 787 Clip Arts. I also got a response from Yahoo for, for that one. At the Nine, we used clip art for all of our party invitations and presentations. We didn't think clip art could get any cooler until we saw this very cool loop of 787 clip arts edited together from OliverLaric.com. I love that. So click on number two and be mesmerized. So these works um, were, I mean, be, they became viral online and they became well-known online before you had the chance to show them in any exhibition space. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, um, 787 Clip Arts made it to the front page of YouTube, which doesn't exist anymore, but they used to be the front page where every day nine new videos were presented. So I was, it was one of my biggest career achievements to be <laughs> on the front page of YouTube. And... Um, that was also, uh, yeah, so I, I had kind of like a lot of circulation, and then at some point I received an email from a curator from New York who um, said, would you like to show this in exhibition space? And that was the, like the novelty um, to me to yeah, do that. Can you, can you tell, us, tell us something about the different kind of reception that you get, I mean, online, and then you get, I mean, in a gallery? 
uh, because of course I, I imagine that online uh, the audience it's much more differentiated, it's much more fragmented and sometimes also it can be an accidental audience, someone that just stumps on, 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 the, on the video and, and they maybe sometimes don't even know that it's uh, an artist's work. They, 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 your, your work can, I don't know, uh, mix, it can be mixed inside a lot of different material that, uh, that it's not necessarily all artistic material. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about these two different kind of receptions and if they are interrelated in some way and in which way they are different and I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm quite happy when the people viewing the material are not necessarily the people who read the same books or have studied art or have maybe um, overlap in terms of my social life. And so um, I, I almost like cherished, not that I cherish the audience more, but it's something that which has happened to me from the beginning and I keep trying to find ways to not just be, um, yeah, within the confines of, uh, yeah, contemporary art institutions. Um, so it remains, remains a big uh, part of me today. And it, it just seemed to me a, a, a bit more exciting what, what happened online at that part. I mean, when Clip Arts went out, I just within like a week, there were like, a f I don't know, three or four remixes from other people. And then a few months later, um, an advertising agency in, in Sydney copied the, the piece. And then they were a bit embarrassed for having copied the work because uh, my video had been viral, so a lot of people were saying, oh, this is a copy of that video. And then they wrote to me and then they offered me money, which had never happened to me before. I'm actually, I realize I'm not allowed to talk about it. I signed a non-disclosure agreement to not <laughs> mention this. So, um, But it was just quite exciting what happened. And um, then the exhibition was more like, you know, I'm, I'm showing this and then people would be like, oh, congratulations. And that was it. There was less um, activity. For my association with the exhibition was less one of activity, but more one of kind of passivity. Yeah. Yeah. And you you mentioned versions which uh, is a series of uh, uh, of video works that it's probably one of the most well known in your production and uh, versions is um, it's it's a very interesting word for different reasons because the we we talk a lot about participation and the, and the the primary uh, consequence of mass particip participation online is the fact that any kind of content can be stolen uh, modified and then re-uploaded and so we see that online content and especially images uh, has become totally unstable they change continuously so online we can find countless versions and hence the title of the work countless versions of the same image and the more uh, popular is the content the the, the more renditions of it uh, you, we can find online and of course with this I don't mean to say that um, participation is a totally new thing and I don't mean to say that content manipulation didn't exist before uh, but the scale and the depth of the phenomenon today is uh, actually unprecedented and so uh, in versions you investigate um, a lot of uh, concepts that uh, po that kept showing also in uh, other work uh, later works for example authorship uh, truth, the, the, the relationship between original and copy, um, but uh, in the internet age, of course, in our age. Uh, but at the same time, also, what I find fascinating about versions is that uh, it um, connects this contemporary topic of uh, the mutability of images uh, to a more general discourse on our perception of the world, on a general discourse on how we see the world, how we use images to represent the world, and how these images change over time. So, uh, and, and in versions you uh, quote uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, you use a lot of different uh, uh, references. For example, you uh, use a reference by, a quote by a musician called Momus, that it's very uh, interesting because the quote says, every lie creates 
a parallel world, a world in which is true. So this is also a reference maybe to quantum physics, so, so to, to how science also reshapes our uh, ideas uh, on the world, but there are, there are also reference to ancient philosophy and, and, and a lot of different kind of sources. Um, so you made, I think, three versions of versions. <laughs> so, and the last one is from 2012, so it's almost 10 years. And so what I would like to ask you if uh, in these 10 years, uh, do you think that our relationship with images has changed in any ways? It has evolved in any way from, I mean, in the last 10 years? I don't know if you have some, uh, have, you, have you witnessed some fundamental change from the, best, the first, I mean, the, sorry, from the last versions of version <laughs> to now? Um. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Um, maybe we can narrow it down to... Um, yeah. We like can, yeah. Um, okay, let me think. Um, this idea of uh, uh, the changeability of yeah. images, uh, is it still kind of the same like in 2012? Uh, and maybe is it change only in scale? I mean, we do it more and more, and the, and the images are more and more unstable and more and more liquid and more and more changeable. Uh, and, and, and so it changes our perception of reality and our ideas of reality, of the, the concept of reality itself and our ideas about truth, about lies, about authenticity. Or from the last time you, uh, um, you, you, you confronted with that work, you see something different, not only in scale, because of course we are, I mean, I think we are still immersed in that kind of situation, I mean, uh, that you described in versions, this, this uh, profound uh, instability of content, this, uh, this fact that everything that we see can be manipulated, we sometimes have difficulties uh, distinguishing real from fake, distinguishing the original uh, object from all the versions made after it. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it has progressed probably in a non-linear way. I'm, I don't think it's necessarily just like the growth of uh, digital media, social media, but there's kind of new ingredients that are added to these shifts and some which um, have gained um, more weight in recent years. I mean, the idea of... I, I don't think it's necessarily a new idea, but the idea of who's talking for whom has become a lot more present. And so yeah. the idea of um, just a free-for-all kind of buffet has maybe changed um, and maybe also makes me reflect differently on of the, uh, the work that I've made around that time. Um, I think the idea around like truth, I, I, I was trying to avoid like a, a binary view of that, but... Um, that has obviously also changed uh, in recent politi like for recent political um, yeah. years. So I don't know. I think it's I any way I summarize it now is going to be really trivial and kind of like simplifying. But I can maybe just speak from my own experience that um, it's not like a linear growth and linear change, but one where things which I wouldn't anticipate affect my view on things. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a complex, a complex situation which, uh, as you said, it's difficult to reduce to a simple answer. And um, another question that I have about versions and uh, about the voiceover, okay, because uh, uh, in the voiceover of the of the of this uh, you use for this video series, um, uh, if if you listen to it, it seems like a, um, a software a text-to-speech software, so like a robotic voice. But I read that actually he, 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 she is an actress that, imitate, uh, that imitates a computer voice. So I would like to ask you why this choice, why to ask a human to simulate uh, a computer voice and not just use the software itself? Well, I was, I was first trying to find the kind of voices behind the voices we hear that are synthesized, like the series, and they're kept quite private or there's not really public knowledge of who is. I think Siri kind of came out recently, yeah. so we know the US Siri, maybe not, I mean, there's like many series around the world. Um, and at the time when I was doing this voiceover, I didn't find 
Um, I think I was, I don't know if I was looking for Sierra, but I was looking for some synthetic voice. I didn't find, didn't find them. And then um, I found this voice actress who had an, an accent which wasn't quite, quite clearly placeable. Like she was Danish, English, and so it was not quite like um, locatable where her voice was from, to me at least. And um, I asked her to simulate this, um, yeah, synthetic voice, and um, that's about it. Yeah, it was more interesting to you to connect, uh, I mean, the, the, our human uh, capabilities, the, the, the capabilities of the human voice with the, with the software, or um, well, I don't know, or, 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 or it maybe also can be read as um, as a way as a, a as an ironic way also to to interpret the, the relationship between humans and machines it w i think it was a voice that i f found familiar at that time okay. and also one that was maybe um um is probably re like related to that moment because i'm assuming that as uh, machine learning progresses and as ai progresses the way Siri sounds now without yeah. like the kind of defaults of um, natural language um, I think will become a relic so um, the unintelligible um, machine learned voice will um, remain or yeah. will be I'm assuming will be harder to distinguish yeah um, what else let me think um, yeah mm, we already uh, talked about this a little bit earlier um, and I uh, I told you that some of your works especially the sculptural ones but not only but not only the sculptural ones uh, also inversions um, some of your works make me think about the concept of uh, uh, cultural memory uh, as conceived by Abi Warburg, by a very famous German art historian, Abi Warburg, because he had this uh, idea of trying to track uh, forms, myths, uh, motives, uh, and images and memories across time and space. So the fact that images uh, travel and change during this travel and, and, and trying to visualize these changes, to identify these, these changes and uh, changes that happens both um, in form but most importantly in meaning. So I would like to ask you if, if you are familiar with the Abi Vabo's work, if he has been an inspiration to you in any way. Yeah, Vabog has become somebody that I think about um, I remember hearing the word when I was starting to show work, people were saying, oh, this is kind of Warburg style or Warburgian. And I was like, oh, who's this Warburg? And then looked it up, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And it happened to me a few times where people were like, oh, you should look at this person. And then I start really um, appreciating their work. And um, Warburg was kind of useful for me in terms of um, seriality and maybe comparison and bringing things together that are from different places in, uh, in time and different geographic regions and um, by kind of bringing them together getting a sense of understanding and he's also been influential or like been actually a useful tool in finding these sculptures that I've been interested in and I mean what you touched on with the sculptures I guess maybe I can uh, yeah. also uh, so there's this archive which is maybe quite Warburgian, which is um, a website that I've been making since two, 2012. And forgive me for like, to the video audience going into this territory of sculpture, but it, it, it does go into video back again. And so these are sculptures which I've been um, digitizing with the consent and without the consent of museums from different places in the world and... Uh, sorry, do you, uh, we, with consent and also without? Yeah. Okay. And so, for example, this is one of the first sculptures I scanned in 2012 or 2013 in a, um, in a museum in the UK, in Lincoln. And I've ended up using the sculpture quite, quite often. It's a new class of sculpture by a British artist called John Gibson. And so if you're interested in this um, sculpture, you can kind of click on download scan and then the 3D model gets downloaded and anybody can utilize the, um, the 3D model without having to pay 
for the usage. It's copyright free because all the works are in the public domain. And it was something which was um, initially hard to convince museums because there's a quite protective understanding of like ownership, even if it is taxpayer financed, but with continuous like more and more experience, like more and more museums getting on board and it became m more of a routine. And um, I, um, yeah, so I can show some examples of what happened. Like for example, with this, this sculpture that I just showed you, um, and maybe while we're also in Italy, so this is um, the Italian contribution to the Eurovision Song Contest 2015. <laughs> Um, Il Volo with Amore and um So I was, you know, just one day watching the Eurovision Song Contest and then this happened and it just was, made me really happy to discover this. And, um, and this and is what happens when you liberate, I mean, knowledge and, <laughs> and you, I mean, and, and you give people the, the, the chance to use freely. And I, it really, I, I yeah. just I could have never predicted it. You lose I, control. I mean, yeah. Uh -huh. And you know, it's I think 200 million people who see this, and they obviously are not going to view this as like my contribution to this is going to be insignificant. But there's something that was just very exciting to me about this happening, uh, that that was also then reused for like a German uh, dance competition, Masters of Dance. Um, this is not it. Where is it? Oh yeah, here. So, so it's, I think somebody designed it for this, for um, Il Volo, and then they probably s sold the rights again. I haven't <laughs> found out who made it, but it's, it's one example that I was quite happy about. I can show, this is, is a close contender to career highlight for me. find where it is. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So it was very brief. This Hunter and Dark sculpture appeared in here as well, another sculpture from John Gibson. But it's Nicki Minaj and Migos, and it's like just, yeah, so I'm very happy about this. <laughs> so um, this happens because actually uh, from big productions to amateur production we, in, in the internet age we end up using the same materials. We just go online, find things and use things. Yeah, th this is interesting too. I th I'm just going to show, I'm, this is, um, yeah, you can tell me if you're bored but, it's, but I'll show you <laughs> one or two more examples. T-Pain. <laughs> What's a good one? Also, this I think that this classical statues uh, fits very well in the vaporwave aesthetics, yeah. which is very popular right now. So there's maybe a, that's another reason why. There's a vaporwave sample pack with all of these yeah. um, sculptures. This was for the EMAs, I think, in the European Music of, Music Media Video Awards. It's, it's also like quite random what gets used. Like this is a sculpture by a French photographer called Francois Villem, who's a really obscure inventor of like a 3D scanning process. And it's just 
It's not so much just like, I don't know, the thinker or Rodin or Michelangelo or something. It's like obscure things which can kind of get a mass uh, audience. And maybe one thing to add about this EMA clip is that the advertising agency who made this um, got in touch with me and asked, are you sure that these are copyright free? <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, yeah, they are, but I quickly installed like a donate button on my website and said, here's a PayPal link, this is a non-profit project, would you mind supporting this? And they, they never, like, never got anything from them and since then I've had probably another 10 advertising agencies doing big production, Nike, whatever else. And, yeah. But then I get every other month like 5, 10, 20, 50 euros from 3D people who are just kind of happy that this, um, that this exists. And um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I have a lot of love for the people who are involved in this. I'm just going to show one more. Say, sorry? Bulgari. Ah, yeah. Are you connected to Bulgari? <laughs> Classic is revolutionary. <laughs> um, Did you find all these things yourself, or people are also? Uh, it's I mean, it's a mix. Writing to you and say, look at that. It's a mix of like yeah. me actually discovering them, um, searching hashtags, yeah. people sending it to me. But it's rarely the people who make it who send it to me. But I'm quite happy about this. I like that. It's, I'm not writing on this website, this is like remix this or do something, it's just like here's an archive and then what happens, happens and if I find out about it, it's great and if not, it's also okay. And I like that there's this potential of unimagined things that I have no idea about, which, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure I've missed something which is maybe as amazing as like a Nicki Minaj video, but I've, I just don't know about it. I'm gonna show one more. This is quite elaborate because it uses many of the scans. It's a Netflix TV show um, called Roman Empire. So this one, this nymph from John Gibson, she's been in uh, Nicki Minaj, Bulgari, this one, she's like one of the most popular ones. Um, but yeah, it goes on. It's basically, I think, uh, many of them who come together. And I don't know if I'm hijacking the conversation now, just focusing on this, but in regards to it being um, with and without yeah. consent, um, I've been, yeah, a lot of times getting the agreement from museums to, to do this. And then sometimes, or actually the first time I didn't get an agreement was when I was trying to get access to a sculpture of Beethoven in a museum in Leipzig. And I was doing a show in Vienna at a space called Secession and I wanted to bring this sculpture back to the Secession. It was initially shown there in 1902. So the artist had been dead for over 70 years. There was no more copyright but the museum director was just and under no com circumstances allowing me to utilize it. And um, let's see. So you get the permission to do the scan because I think you need the permission to do the scan, but don't, then you don't get the agreement to, no, I, I to didn't publish get, it. I didn't get the permission to, to oh, do to the scan. Oh, so this the is scan. the sculpture okay. I wanted to get and mm -hmm. I went to meet the, the director and he said under no circumstances, no. Mm -hmm. a misinterpretation of the work, what you're okay. doing. And uh, here I have a picture of the director sitting <laughs> on the right side with uh, another sculpture which um, he has. But anyways, he didn't agree to it, but I found a way how to get it anyways, which was by doing photogrammetry. So instead of going there with a 3D scanner, I took, sent a photographer who took hundreds of pictures. And then if you have these pictures, you can generate a rough 3D model. And from that rough 3D model, you can generate a more 
finished polished version. So this was the out output I received from um, using photogrammetry or from taking photographs. And then after working with a 3D sculptor, I kind of made like a digital sculptor. I got this really high res version. So you can kind of see the difference. Um, there's like at the top of the throne, there's a figure which had to be added. And yeah, and then I was free to do whatever I wanted with it. And um, at that point, I also started working with a copyright lawyer who started having a little back and forth with the copyright lawyer of the city of Leipzig who um, wanted to keep me from publishing this. And my lawyer said that the museum has certain responsibilities among them to store um, and to archive and to display works, but not to restrict public interpretation. And that his client will be happy to go to court to fight this case for future generations. And my lawyer happens to work for Wikipedia who agreed to pay for the court cost. And then it went on for a while. And in the end, I think they thought it was maybe embarrassing to sue somebody who's making something accessible to the public that belongs to the public. Yeah. And so now this model is circulating and people are utilizing it for whichever purposes. And um, that's when I started not depending on digital, or like, sorry, consent from a museum. And okay. yeah, and I brought it back to the secession uh, as it's you, shown here. You had to conduct a little fight for... Yeah, yeah. But, but I'm uh, slightly sad that it didn't go to a court case because it just would have been more exciting and I had the financial <laughs> backing, but yeah, maybe in the future. Okay, <laughs> okay you didn't get the final confrontation. <laughs> no. Um, okay, switching uh, topic for a second. Uh, your name is uh, very often associated with the word post-internet, with the post-internet movement, uh, not only for, I mean, anagraphic reason, but uh, also because you uh, always um, work both online and offline at the same time. You kind of uh, mix different uh, media, you mix the different dimensions, and also your artistic practice uh, was, I think, born in the context of online art communities, but you also uh, work in more, on more uh, traditional uh, platforms like museums and private galleries. Uh, so, um, for, firstly, I would like to uh, ask you what do you think about this post-internet categorization, if you like it, if you find it significant or um, in any way uh, uh, useful to describe your work and the work by your fellow uh, artists, your uh, friends, and I mean your generation, uh, uh, the, the same generation as you. Um, but, uh, uh, and also more, more importantly, I would like you to uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, integrate uh, online and offline work and, and maybe how you choose which, uh, which media do you want to use, which material, and, and how to translate a project from one form to another form. Because, for example, um, I was... Should we, and should we just... Um, let me... Yeah, just yeah. answer the first question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, the post-internet word has been kind of shameful for initially, or like I didn't associate with it, or I found it was problematic, maybe like, um, I don't know, spaghetti western was probably not a term that was <laughs> endearing to... Um, Italian uh, producers, but at a certain point it also stuck. I think when the kind of people who weren't involved in it were starting to claim it, then I was getting a little bit um, uh, yeah, defensive. It was like, no, that's... Or maybe then I was like starting to identify with it more. But I... Maybe it's useful. I, I don't think about it too much. It's kind of a term that floats around. I don't use it necessarily to describe myself, but when people talk about it, I kind of know what they mean. Um, I view it maybe a little bit more like it could be the other way around instead of saying post-internet you could be like black and white TV only became black and white TV with the introduction of colored television or the acoustic guitar only became the acoustic guitar with um, the electric guitar so maybe it could be pre-internet art and now it's just art but I, that won't um, catch on but I think I'm, I, I have like a mixed Mixed feeling with Mixed the feeling, term. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Um, and then, oh yeah, to kind of how I relate between... Yeah, uh, online and offline, and, uh, and maybe also uh, more... It, it would be also interesting to uh, discuss how you uh, choose the material and the medium to use and how you uh, 
uh, translate maybe one concept to one form to another form because I was really I remember being and also quoted this in the book I remember uh, you described versions I think was the first maybe um, uh, version of the work as a series of sculptures, hairbrushed images of missiles, a talk, a PDF, a song, a novel, a recipe, a play, a dance routine, a feature film, and merchandise. Uh, and maybe it was, uh, I mean, in a, in, a, in a funny way, an ironic way to stress this idea that a concept can shape shift and can take many different forms. So, yeah. For me, there's no very clear distinction because they all are entangled. Like for when I talk about this 3D scans project, I've been trying to show it in museums, but it's very hard to show it because the exciting part happens online and it's something which is alive and hard to like put into a single screen or multiple screens or into a few objects. So I feel um, with these works, they're connected and then it's some kind of artificial um, breaking it down into a palatable unit for um, an exhibition, for example. And I, I mean, I could just to explain this better. Um, well, this video, for example, is which I think we showed yesterday. It was a way of um, making a video or this is a video, but then also this, for example, um, has become a public monument in in Belgium. Um, so I kind of made a series of it, not this exactly, but this idea um, is now a monument along the Belgian coastline of a toad transforming into a table. And then um, this right here is a sculpture that's in the Vatican Museum of um, a half Anubis, half um, Hermes, so it's Hermanubis. And um, I also made this into a physical sculpture. And I guess the video for me could be kind of like almost research for, or like an experimentation for different manifestations of work. So I might in the future take something else that came out of this and turn it into a different um, medium. So I don't have like a, a clear um, understanding at first. Mm -hmm. It's more like these are experiments or things that I would like to try and then, um, yeah. It's Something it's, comes it's, out of it's it. It's an organic process. You, yeah. you, okay. And uh, maybe we can talk about a little bit about your latest work, the one you presented here, the Untitled. From You made it this year or last year? Uh, this year, yeah. This year. And uh, in, uh, in this work, um, the, I mean, the most evident... Uh, presence, the most evident topic is metamorphosis. I mean, not only in this video, because metamorphosis showed up in a lot of your works, uh, also in the uh, the one you just showed us uh, now. But in, in this particular work, in Untitled, we see uh, these computer-generated images that are continuously uh, morphing into one another, and, and we see animals, human beings, and plants, and different kinds of uh, of things, like also cells, for example. And, and uh, this idea of things morphing into one another uh, made me think about uh, metamorphosis as something that we can see in the natural world but also in the cultural world and this is some this is a comparison that I that maybe I don't know uh, you can uh, also tell me maybe it's also interesting uh, in your work because you uh, show how things shape also literally sometimes because we actually see uh, an animal turning into a table, so you, we see the metamorphosis. But also, uh, you, you may. This is also a reference to how things change in, in the cultural sphere. So mutation in nature, in biology. I mean, but also mutation in cultural concepts, in ideas. I don't know. I don't know if you ever uh, thought about this uh, different uh, concept of metamorphosis. I mean, in biology and in culture? Uh, yeah, um, it was for me, I think, a way of dealing with too much certainty. So the metamorphosis or transformation, shape-shifting allows me to think about um, both cultural concepts and theory in ways where there is 
um, just a kind of a, a wide range of possibilities and not like a strict fixed sense of, of identity. And um, before when we had this um, group of talks with um, other artists who are visiting right now, I was mentioning to them that um, I, um, I came across a book called uh, Metamorphosis by Rosi Braidotti, which um, was highly influential for me. So if anybody wants, uh, a, a, I was looking for a book to read, I would highly recommend it's from 2012. And her take on metamorphosis is through the lens of um, gender theory and it's um, one of the most important books for me. So her um, summarized, the emphasis in her book is on locating and opening up the moments between A and B and viewing it as a space of productive potential. And I think um, I cannot not do justice to the book, but this is something which kind of stuck with me and uh, was helpful for me in terms of how I, how I think. I don't know if we have uh, and still have time or if you want to um, take questions, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I did actually in 2000, let me see. So there was an exhibition at the um, Palazzo Strozzi. So this is from the Museo Archeologico Nazionale in, in Florence. Um, so there's a few. Um, it was an exhibition which brought together Hellenistic bronzes and um, I had the permission from the museum in Florence. They kindly agreed to let me make some scans. The British Museum really, really wasn't keen on it, neither was the, the Getty um, Museum, but um, let me see if I can find this. Why do you think museums are still so... Uh, but this, I mean, this one is from yeah. the Getty Museum. This was in the exhibition. And so during lunch break, I scanned this one. And now it's also online. So this was also scanned in Florence. Why do you think museums are so still so protective uh, of the copyright? It, it, is this just, a, I mean, an, an economical issue? Uh, or, or, or it's m a more complex cultural one? I think there's multiple fears and then it's different from, from country to country in my, uh, in my experience. Um, the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands is very progressive in that regards. They've made their whole like image database accessible to anybody to utilize even for commercial purposes. But copyright law differs from country to country and Italy has a very strong protection of um, authorship. So in most countries, the um, age when something enters the public domain is 75 years after the death of an author. And in Italy, I think if you are the descendant of somebody, you can still take claims. So you could be the great, 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 great granddaughter of somebody and you could still take claims. And France is also a bit more strict, and which means that, for example, um, Rodin, even though he's dead for over, over 75 years, has copyright protection in France. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's something which I have appreciation for to a degree, I mean, it's very dry at one part, but then it's also interesting for me to see how these laws are n navigated and defined and how much subjectivity there is in the idea of copyright and that it's not like strict dogma, but there's yeah, a lot of gray zones. Anyone else? Uh, Getting you a microphone. Thank you. Uh, does this uh, practice of uh, scanning and then uh, printing the, the pieces uh, had uh, an influence on the circulation of your work? Like, for example, for the sessions, the session uh, show, would you send the files and, and ask the museum to print the, the, the pieces, and then you come only for the display or something? That would be that would be nice. I, I really like the idea of. Um, just sending an email, but it is a lot more, more complex than that, unfortunately. So I do make them uh, and they kind of get assembled in, uh, in Berlin and they're quite like labor intensive. There's often this mis misconception or this perception that like 3D printing is like a kind of one press activity. And um, 
but yeah, I, I, I spend quite a bit of time um, making them. I show a quick. Well, anyways, you can see, so this is a sculpture that I made for the Liverpool Biennial. This was for the Secession. Um, this was this is from the Musée d'Orsay, which I, I, I assume you might know, which I made for the Schinkel Pavilion in Berlin and uh, for the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, so, yeah, and then the one that appeared in the Migos video, uh, Sao Paulo Biennial, and now in Stedelijk Museum in Ghent. And so, yeah, there's there's quite a bit of work that that goes into them, but maybe at some point I would I would love to to work that way. Can I ask you which kind of materials do you use? I mean, apart from marble, maybe. Uh, I do use marble, but usually as a kind of a powder, and I mix it with a mm -hmm. resin to so to kind of cast marble or aluminum or other um, like sculpture materials and nylon and um, yeah. 3D printing materials, so. So plastics? Yeah. Um, also, yeah, some bronze, copper, oh. quite, yeah, a variety. Thanks. I was curious because I, I see a lot of different textures and colors, so I was curious about the materials. Yeah, um, we didn't talk about this, um, but I saw an NFT folder there, and I was kind of <laughs> wondering about your opinion about it, since it's a really topical uh, thing that is now. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have that many folders uh, or examples of NFTs in here. There's um, a lot that are happening. Um, I just... I, just um, I, I saw you, you posted one, maybe couple of days ago, there are NFT based on one of the scans. Oh, this one maybe? Yeah, this is this is one of the most recent ones. So yeah. there's a kind of street where um, convention in LA called ComplexCon and they had a NFT battle where two people like made NFTs. Um, and on the left side, you can see this guy called Stephen Balte who utilized um, one of my scans to make this and which then was also auctioned as an NFT and it's one of the last um, objects I scanned in Innsbruck. It's a, this sculpture right here. And um, I, I've also um, minted or made NFTs and it's something which I'm uh, interested in. It's something which I think is very hard to pinpoint at the moment. It's kind of like talking about social media in the 90s. Um, the way it gets, in my opinion, the way it gets talked about in media is very narrow and usually it's related to a price tag. Um, I think the more interesting applications right now are in um, kind of communal ownership, in DAOs, I don't know if you're familiar with decentralized autonomous uh, organizations. So there's these methods um, or these structures which are coming out of the kind of NFT conversation which I find really exciting. Um, and I think the NFT is like a rotating 3D model is thinking of it uh, um, in very limited terms. Not that I'm saying that you were talking about it this way, but this is kind of the usual kind of NFT um, conversation I get, like, that I hear. But I'm, I'm very interested in the potential of NFTs and um, I've, I've made some and I'm, I'm working on some right now. So um, I remember a conversation in Transmediale like three years ago. Um, the panelists were really pissed because uh, Google Tour was kind of uh, having the right, the copyrights, to scan all the museums everywhere in the world. And they were pissed because um, usually it's not so easy to get this kind of copyright, but museums, because of Google has had the name of Google, he could kind of do that without actually any proper, um, how do you say, like they didn't have instruction of how the, the scan would be used in the future. So 
I was just wondering if you um, kind of get into this topic and also <laughs> another question. Um, uh, because of, you know, uh, um, now the, there has been a lot of talks about metaverse and, you know, the metaverse and stuff, but um, there is this um, perception of uh, tourism linked to also the corona experience. And the impression is that in the future, more and more, um, oh shit, uh, more and more um, tourists would travel through the metaverse or through virtual spaces because uh, they overloaded of, you know, all the uh, tourist structures, let's say, so airport and cities are, not, are kind of overloaded. So, and also because of capital footprint and all of this. So uh, I'm just wondering if you are thinking also about that. So uh, the project you are making with the 3D status may be kind of integrated in this uh, new virtual tourism activity that uh, we will have in the future. That's interesting. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're <laughs> building CGI monuments for the metaverse. <laughs> Well, um, in regards to, to, to Google, um, I don't know if it was that easy for them. I think they moved to Paris to have like a good base to establish like their reach within Europe as maybe also one of the hardest kind of nuts to crack and um, the Google Arts and Culture Initiative. And um, I think they, yeah, they have probably different means, but I don't know what, whatever in like, regards to 3D scanning. I'm still surprised that what what they have is like doesn't compare to what I don't want to like, you know, say this is so great, but it's it's it doesn't compare to what I've been doing. And they also, I mean, they they did it later, but it's basically um, looking at some 3D models online and like rotating them. And I would assume with the financial means you could do something more interesting. So I think in, at least in that regards, it's kind of a misguided energy. Or I'm not. In, uh, I don't know, I'm not imp impressed by the output. I'm also, um, Google makes me think differently about what I do. So when I started making things accessible, I think I had a certain like idea of like, yeah, just make everything available to everybody. But that changed for me also when Google starts making everything available to everybody because there's kind of a overriding of individual subjectivity and of authorship. It becomes, there's like a leveling where nothing really matters. It's just like aggregating as much data as possible. So maybe I don't want to be part of the same kind of conversation as, as Google. And so it makes me reflect, do I need to, you know, be more specific with, with, what, with what I do or do I need to change my approach? Because I don't want to be part of this kind of monopoly platform um, culture model. And in regards to the metaverse, I feel the, it's not maybe like the, my strength to talk about it, but the idea of this metaverse coming now or being this new thing feels a bit odd to me because I have a feeling it's kind of like slowly creeping up on us and maybe the idea of like people going to this website and experiencing these sculptures is, is already kind of part of that trajectory. So um, I think that's, that's happening. Okay, I think we don't have time, uh, time's up. So thank you very much everyone for, for having thank us. Thank you to Valentina Tanni and thanks to Oliver Larry. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you to all of you and we'll see you in a while for the screenings of the afternoon. Thank you.